do. I will pass the baton to, uh, to Simon, who joins us today from Zurich, I believe. Yes. Thank you so much, Simon, for taking the time today. Thank you very much, Vera, for this kind introduction. I'm very happy to being able to show some, some uh, works, but also some uh, things I found on my way from also being a master student, uh, as most of you. Um, to where I am now. And um, yeah, I'll try to share in a very open and simple way some of the findings um, for you to anticipate and hopefully uh, be able to use that in any possible way. So um, yeah, my lecture is around an hour 15, if that's okay, from like, let's see how long it takes. Well, depends a bit how I'll speak. Um, and I'll share my screen. <clears throat> How to? Um, so the topic for today, to work with luxury and specialized industry, um, I guess Vera, you just described when you were sitting with Valentina and Javier, that was kind of where you thought I fit the best, but however, you probably could have put me in many other topics uh, as well. Um, so I'll try to uh, show some of the things really related to this topic, but obviously I'll make a much broader um, view on what I think uh, is relevant for you. Um, and uh, I'll start with a project that I discovered not so long ago, uh, which is a sword. And it's probably the oldest sword that we have in possession. It's around 5,000 years old. And um, when this news came out, and you could see it in quite some different medias, that they dated uh, this sword back to, to that long ago. Um, even they had a possession of this object for a long time. Um, it really, really struck me, especially for the fact that I thought it was immensely beautiful. I'm not a sword or weapon guy, but just the form of it just touched me, I must uh, say. Um, so for me, um, and I'll get back to the topic, this object really meant something. And, um, and I would like to use it as an introduction for the fact that, yeah, we can say that 5,000 years ago, there was already someone designing an object that was probably not a weapon to fight. At least they said it was never probably used. Um, it was probably a gift for someone's grave. Um, so it's really, it's, a, it's an object to, to cherish. And that I thought uh, can really give us a mindset of someone already had to define the shape of that such a long time ago. So we're not really talking about something new here. Uh, it's, it's one of the oldest things people do. Um, so for me, if I might adapt the whole theme of this uh, talk, it's not just for the luxury industry, it's to kind of getting through a demanding creative process in general. And obviously working with larger clients in an industry such as luxury or specialized goods, um, they are demanding because they have the opportunity to work with all kinds of different clients. So they will ask you to make, uh, to jump back and forth um, to work with them. So yeah, I'll just kind of modify to that. So a bit about myself. Um, I've been working uh, in product design uh, for quite some years. Um, after I graduated uh, in industrial design in Germany, uh, I moved to Zurich in 1999 to work with Hannes Wettstein, um, a quite famous uh, product and interior designer at the time. And um, for him, I mainly worked on like smaller uh, techie goods. I did a lot of watches together with him, like this one for Ventura and like besides really industrial design step-by-step -step things, uh, I also was super interested in interface stuff. So I was able to design and 
elaborate a font for this watch. Um, Lamy was a client we worked for. So from a very early professional uh, working time, I was able to learn and understand the mechanisms of those industries. However, basically it comes down to making a good design proposal. It's not in that sense rocket science, um, but there are quite a few codes to know and I'll uh, talk more about that later. Um, besides industrial design, I also worked with Hannes on like large uh, special furniture such as this um, huge 10 plus meter long meeting table for a, uh, for a building in St. Gallen um, that you could open so everyone had a better view on the presentation slides of a screen. Um, yeah, And when Hannes Wettstein passed away, um, I was one of the people to uh, do a publication about him uh, with Lars Müller publications, um, where we not just showed like a lot of different projects that he made. Uh, we also revealed uh, the, the making process uh, of how he would get to those objects. And we made a kind of numbered archive of all the different objects that we found that he was involved in. Um, and in the end, we also did an exhibition at the ETH in Zurich uh, with the GTA Institute. Um, yeah, and that's one of the images from that exhibition. Now, um, when I worked there, for me, Hannes was some sort of in-house oracle, meaning I didn't really have to perform in questions regarding the why or the how. I just had to perform a question of, we have an idea how to, you know, formalize it, how to narrate it, how to make the precise shape. Um, and that was quite comfortable, obviously, because the hardest part in any project, at least from my point of view, is to find the why, to find the exactly positioning of a decision. And once the decision is made, it's basically, you know, just working hard to make the best of that idea or decision. And while I was working there, this for me was not necessary. And I uh, realized that as long as I'm inside this huge shadow of such um, genius, creative person, I could never get to this point. Even I got super freedom of coming up with my own ideas. I was kind of stuck in that, um, I don't know, overshadowing, overshadow of, of knowledge. Um, and that made me to quit and to do a master uh, degree at the Royal College of Art. So uh, I kind of got myself out of the comfort zone from Lake Zurich going to rainy London and um, the reason for that was what I realized at the time is what clients want from you, what they pay you for, why they open their wallet and give you money for what you did. They want answers from you. And to be able to give them answers, you have to have an opinion. And it is hard to formulate an opinion if you don't have to. So, I assume that most of you put yourself in the pos uh, position to do a master's degree because you want to be able to have an opinion and to be able to give answers. So that's just a moment in time where I realized that um, I had to change myself in order to progress. Uh, this is an interesting quote. I'll just run it. I hope you can hear it. Some guy in advertising said something that's really interesting. He said, uh, product plus personality equals brand. I thought that was really cool. And I think maybe I try and apply that to what I do. I also think it's a pretty cool quote. <laughs> so product plus personality equals brand. Um, why I find it so interesting that it seems to be quite a simplified version of what's necessary to create something that's called brand, 
which could be actually used for anything. So if we look at a company and you think of brand equals Nike and so on. So that would mean that the product is a shoe and personality is what you look at the company and you think about it. That would be my like simplified way of looking at it. Now, if I transfer this to you as a master student, then you could say you are a brand because you do work, you do show yourself, you have a name. So your product is your work, meaning your ability to design something, to make plans, to come up with ideas, and your personality is yourself. Um, and that makes a brand. Um, so if you apply for a job, you are there in a way, the same way like a brand would uh, approach. Um, if you start your own office, then it's obviously much more clear that this office is a brand now. So I find this um, three words to be very uh, eye-opening about many things of a system that personality is just a central part of it. Now, what is personality? Um, and I was looking it up. This is not something I wrote myself, but um, it's based on identity. And this is something you give yourself, like who you want to be, what are your morals, your values. And then by living it, by actually doing it, um, you shape your, your personality. And that for me is an interesting understanding of it's in your hands, um, but you have to understand what you're doing and you have to make decisions on manipulating that. It, just, it doesn't just happen by itself. The more considerate your ideas about that is of who you want to be and where you want to go, obviously the more precise your actions can be. And I'll get back to that at the very end of the talk. So just uh, keep it in mind. Um, if you are not in interior architecture, but in art, the same question would be much easier because the first thing someone asks you when you enter a school of uh, fine art is who are you? What do you stand for? What are your values, your morals? What, why? And in interior architecture, at least how I experienced it so far, it's not really the case. You're trained, you get all these super cool like opportunities and, and inputs, but it's not so necessary that you have to make a position as clear as an artist would have to. And that for me is okay. Like not everyone has to become a, you know, self uh, explanatory uh, personality in interior architecture or design or architecture or wherever you want to get at the end of the day. Um, however, if you have an understanding of who you are, things would just be so much easier. And I know from my own um, past that this is one of the absolute most difficult things to do, to define who you are and what you stand for. So um, yeah, I'll just drop some suggestions and ideas on you to find that answer or many answers, I don't know. Um, so in the core of what I'm telling you today is also how to know who you are. Um, I go back to my own master uh, studies at the RCA and um, I found this sketch that I made in part of the, of the course that I was in, where we had to make a kind of plan of action, I think they called it, um, to say this is what we did, this was what we planned to do in the coming months. So I kind of organized this first year of two that I had um, to see um, you know, what, what was in the making. And one of the things I elaborated, uh, I make, made a, a, a box around it was a booklet. And in that booklet, I tried to identify myself in terms of like, what, is, what are my interests? Like what, how to understand where this is going. And I made a few maps. This is just two of them. 
um, trying to understand a bit my core interests. So these are professions that I just collected and tried to make a map of what is the most central to me and less and maybe also interesting, but not to, just to get a bit of understanding. And I did the same with possible projects and, and themes that I could work with. Um, so again, this is a very early stage in my own thinking process, but I think it helped me to move on. And this is something I ask uh, every time I run an atelier with the BA students. This is something I ask the students to do on the very first day of this atelier, um, to make a map of their interests. I think it's extremely helpful and I think it's super helpful for you as well. Um, so what else I did there? I gathered tons of inspiration. This was one of the people I was most fascinated by. I really, really love to date his work. Um, and yeah, I found topics in there that really uh, inspired me that I really wanted to continue my own uh, ideas based on that tricks. And this is one of the first experiments I made. Uh, we spent wire and light and shadow and, and moving things. So I built this funny disc with these weird wire shapes and I tried to bend them in a way that if you see them from the side, you don't know what they mean. If the light goes exactly through the right angle, then they will indicate the time. So my intention was to make a clock out of that, like a, something, a time telling object. And this is a later uh, stage of that. Obviously it's running much too fast because these are the hours of the day. So you will see what time it is by the fact that it's the only number that you can read properly. Um, and I also continue that thought into a huge installation in a park in uh, Kensington Gardens, the Hyde Park, um, where you had to walk through these numbers to find uh, a position that would then tell the time. However, um, those ideas, um, they all came down to three uh, ingredients, let's say. They all had to do with time, with light and shadow. And I was really intrigued by this trick of the eye stuff. So I decided at least for that particular time to kind of focus my energy on that. Uh, Cause it was in like my core interest. Um, what I didn't really know was what to do with it. Why, you know, that would form an interesting body of work, whether I would become an artist or would approach galleries or I didn't really care, to be honest. Um, and now looking back, I think if I would have made up my mind about those questions, it would have changed radically certain de decisions I made at the time in terms of how to do the things. Maybe I would have done the same projects, but I would have maybe documented them differently um, and so on. So I think what's really uh, the center of what I'm trying to say is the more you learn about um, your intentions and your interests and the reasoning behind where you wanna go with yourself, the better you can um, tailor make every decision you do on projects and so on towards that. So some incomplete suggestions. This is really design process as basic as that. So don't take it too serious. And it's, as I said, incomplete. But I think what's really super relevant is that you get your inspirations organized. Um, so every one of us has folders and links and just piles of stuff. And the better you kind of find a system that works for you um, to make this, you know, accessible, that you have a project and you remember, ah, I saw this great, ah, what, what was his name? Uh, I'm not a guy to remember things well. And I know some people that are like a lexicon, like you just ask them and they're like that. I'm not like that. So um, 
being able to find a system that works with ABC or pictures or clusters. Um, so you can get back to what you've seen and experienced. So you can use that for your current work is from my point of view, extremely essential. And again, what I do at the beginning of each, each semester that I run uh, is not just to ask for this map, it's also asking the students to make a small um, Pecha Kucha 2020-20 presentation about the inspirations, which is super joyful. So you see super interesting projects, places some people went, materials they're interested in, art, architecture, everything. And yeah, this is a really nice way to get to know each other because you look a bit behind a person when you know about their inspiration. But it's also the first time to kind of make decision of, okay, I have all these folders with pictures and links. Now I'm using those 10 to show them to the rest of the class to say, this is what I like. This is what really inspires me. These are my personal heroes. And it's not a final thing. You know, you can do this. Like sometimes people come back to me a year later or two years later um, to, to run another project with me. And most of them will show different pictures, not because they got bored by the old ones, but they progress over time. So it's really interesting to have this kind of a screenshot almost of your inspiration at the time. Um, wait, I have to go back to say something about that. First, I'm showing you a little video of um, inspirations that I collected for an installation slash presentation of myself <clears throat> that I did eight, two years ago. And it's all to do <clears throat> with scenography, with um, ideas that truly inspired me about the idea of presenting in an immersive way. So it's a six minute video, just showing mind blowing stuff, at least for me, um, that I kind of concluded in this short inspiration video. And it was part of the exhibition I did, the installation where you would run through a maze of dark tunnels and so on. And you reach this one point where you find this screen and a headphone, and then you see this video. Ah, we have to run this again. Please bear with me. Rather than saying, hey, last night I went to this show, it's like, oh my gosh, last night this crazy thing happened. And I think that's what's shifted in over the past 20 years, that almost the live has become the event. And everyone's craving for those moments that where you feel alive, you feel like oh, time stands still and you're truly living. I don't want to do a show that you all have feeling like you've just had Sunday lunch. I want you to come out either feeling recovered or exhilarated, as long as it's an emotion. If you, if you leave without emotion, then I'm not do, doing my job properly. So 
the moment when something collapses it is in intensely disappointing and this is the fourth time it's fallen and each time I got to know the stone a little bit more it got higher each time so it grew in proportion to my understanding of the stone and that is really what one of the things that my art is trying to do is trying to understand the stone I obviously don't understand it well enough yet. Love, a job you find joy from, is not something you discover. It's not like, I found love. Here it is. I found a job I love. That's not how it works. Both of those things require hard work. You are in love because you work very hard every single day of your life to stay in love. You find a job that brings you ultimate joy because you work hard every single day to serve those around you and you maintain that joy. It's not a discovery. <laughs> process simply wanting to recreate something that captured my imagination but obviously it morphed into something much larger than that it wasn't about fluid dynamics or motion control it was about patience and persistence the value of surrounding yourself with people who get this cannot be overstated david wouldn't quit which taught me to power through even when it might not make sense on paper every time we failed we learned something so ask yourself this what are you too intimidated to try all you got to do is fill the tank back up and give it another shot. Oh, I've got the secondaries. Look at those, man. Wow. So that was my short video. I hope you enjoyed. Um, and yeah, I think there is quite a few interesting quotes in there. Um, I'll not get into detail, but let's continue our uh, incomplete list. Uh, making mood boards, uh, I think, has worked tremendously well for me at least, uh, especially when you put them into place. And this is a picture I found which shows a bit more beautiful than in my own atelier how I do it. It looks a bit more messy. But this idea of organizing themes and um, possible directions with numbers, with names uh, on boards and put them in your space, like surround yourself with them. It works so good that you see them, you look at them again, something else comes to mind, it's exposure. And obviously you don't, you're not able to do that with everything you're doing. So it has to be the thing that is the most active and the most dominant in your current stream of work. So for you at the moment, it should be your master's project, um, but you can fill your room, your atelier space, wherever you are working with those mood boards and just narrate them. They can consist of inspiration, of your sketches, of everything. So I think it's extremely helpful. Uh, another thing which seems obvious, 
but uh, learning to draw enough good to being able to formulate shape from an idea couldn't be more helpful. Um, and there is only one way to get there and it's just to draw a lot. And even drawings don't look well at the beginning, they will. There is no question about it. Um, it's all a matter of practice. And some people are super gifted with the nicest you know, drawing hands. Uh, others, including me, are not. But by drawing a lot, you get somewhere. So I looked up the first drawing I put into a sketchbook and it's 20 years ago. This was the drawing. It's not a child drawing, even it looks a bit like it. It has to do with design. There was something about a scooter I was finding cool. Uh, however, I got a long way from there, obviously, but you have to make a start. And obviously your master students, you already know how to draw but some of you might feel like it could be better and you're a bit ashamed and you're not really using it to put something on paper to show to a client like, look, <laughs> here it is, get there, just bloody draw. And you can have your sketchbooks or paper or however everyone finds their own system, but the time you spend formulating idea on paper with a pen should be long. Uh, simulate things in one-to-one. -one. Of course, if you're making a skyscraper, it's not so easy, but most of you probably will be um, with projects that are small enough to actually try them, or at least in parts. Um, and this one-to-one -one simulation is so super helpful. Uh, I use it every time I can with the ateliers I'm running. And uh, this is two examples. We worked on a project um, based on the drawings of the Refuge Tonneau. Um, and the students had to come up with alternative interior ideas. You maybe have come across this project. Uh, it was last year. And we built this one-to-one -one mock up so the students could sit inside, understand the space, um, and make their ideas. Uh, into that space tailor-made and that changed dramatically how some of them understood what the hell they're doing um, and it's not enough to do that you also have to spend time and really reflect it's something we sometimes forget is that the making is one thing but the really anticipation again i'll get back to that later of what did I just do and what does it mean is a major part of that action. So spending their time to just look and think. Uh, you might have seen the uh, space duality project that we made with the virtual reality uh, goggles. And this was during that process to define basically the size of the pattern that we then put with these funny uh, carpets on everything. So we had, um, a projection we had one of the of the furnitures and we just tried to see what should be the size for those elements and that is something so easy you just need a projector um, and you can test very very uh, precisely the measurements um, whatever you're doing make a lot of variations and that is unnecessary to say whether it's model making drawings, sketches, just, you know, open, open, open. It cannot be too many variations. And then obviously you have to take this out and out and out and move on. And yeah, this is obviously in every creative area, whether it's architecture or art, it just helps to find different, different, different ideas. Um, and uh, yeah. This iterative process, I'll show something about that later on. Um, know your process. Uh, so the better you understand that from where you are now to where you want to get, what are the steps you want to take? Um, obviously, the better you can plan time and energy into that. So finding your own way of what works best. Some people are very fast with model making, others draw more or make 3D. Um, don't spend too much time on the computer is my suggestion. But however, it will take a lot of time 
And unfortunately, there is no tricks to get faster through that. Sometimes you're lucky and it doesn't take too much time. Sometimes it takes forever. Um, creativity, uh, what does it? Uh, it's basically kind of a narration of existing things. That's why I think it's so bloody important that you understand your inspiration. So the more you know, the more you know, the more you have in your brain to digest and to rearrange and shake in your, uh, in your shaking thing, in your cocktail glass uh, to make something new and something tailor-made for the client or the project you're working on. Um, now, this is a reference I found uh, in tech. Uh, it's a pretty bad video or the sound is very cheesy. However, the guy was one of the uh, engineers that worked on the original iPhone. So they had to come up with um, the ways of how you could use a touch screen to type, which was extremely difficult. They couldn't find uh, a way to do that um, precisely, to use such a tiny keyboard, which today for us is so normal to type a text on this tiny bloody piece of glass. But when they developed it, it seemed absolutely impossible. And he was apparently the one who came up with an idea that kind of drew the project through the barrier of being rejected or continued. Um, so it's an interesting person. Um, and he describes the moment of creation in the team, this iterative process, meaning you have to do many, many variations and you find something that works. But in the moment you do, it's not like, yay, we found it. It's totally not like that. It's like one of the 50 shitty ideas you have, but by selecting them and moving on, it might grow and it might become more, like this idea of the Eureka uh, moment in time is absolutely rare. It happens sometimes in the project where you feel like that was it. This is the idea, yes. But many, many, many times, you're just making variations, 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 variations. And like you select again, you show, you discuss, and you grow, 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 and it just goes very, very slow. And to prove that point, let's say, let's see what he has. And then we would make demos uh, and something you could try out right away. And you know, the thing is, these first demos and prototypes are never any good. You know, you think that there is going to be some genius aha moment, but it never works like that. Well, hopefully there's some little kernel in there. There's some aspect of it that's stronger than other aspects of it. And so you, you go and look for those strong parts. Natural world uses natural selection, generation after generation, improving and improving. In technology, we have creative selection, taking our ideas and building up a product from these humble beginnings. It's a long, iterative, evolutionary process. A long, iterative, evolutionary process. So whether you're working for the luxury industry or on your master project or some other apartment for your uncle, it's the same, doesn't matter. Uh, this I think is an interesting quote. Um, achieving mastery uh, requires 10,000 hours. You can now calculate how many days and weeks and years that is, but it's very obvious to have that in mind. Meaning if you're a violin player, and you want to become a master violin player, you'd better practice. If you want to become a master interior architect, it will take a lot of time, no matter what. Um, and if you are more the person that jumps from things to things, you want to do a product, here you do interior, here you do furniture, then you make a lighting, then you make that, it's hard to say you will become a master master of this one topic. You're more generalist. And that can also be a mastery to be within. But, and now I'm coming back to one of the things I said before, it's better you know about that. It's better you want to be a generalist and not a super spe specialist on one point. 
If that's the case, fine. If not, change it. Um, investigate emotions. Uh, it's something I realized the more, the longer, the more that the more access you have to understand emotions, how they work, how they work for you and how they work for others, the better you can make probably anything. Uh, and I found an interesting uh, reference in an interview uh, about music, which has nothing to do with luxury industry. However, the point is interesting. So if you find one, what do you do with it? Let's say you, you hear something in that moment, you have that experience, you've shazammed it. Yeah. Next, what happens? I just want to listen to it over and over and over again and really understand what I'm feeling mm -hmm. and why I feel that way. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a whole, like, university of science between what's being played and what you're hearing. Yes. So you're analyzing yourself as much as the music. Yeah. Because if you don't, then you don't really, you're not really getting the proper assessment of what's happening. So the proper assessment of what's happening. Um, I try to look back into my own past regarding design. Um, of those moments where I felt, you know, I, I get something. There is a moment in time where I understand. I look, it's like x-ray. I look into something. There is, I understand something. And one of the most probably influential experiences I had was during uh, an exhibition in Kassel, Germany, um, about 10 years ago. And I saw this um, installation by this artist. You enter a room and there is a projector and this projector just projects one large, super bright white dot on a white wall. Now you get closer to this and you can see people just, you know, looking what that is and then you see that in that dot there is a picture frame and in order to be able to get closer to this picture frame and being able to see what it is about you have to get into this super bright light it's kind of like getting on a stage of of a theater because now you're like it's all quite dark and now you're like super bright so you have to have the courage of going there. And some people will just stand a bit to the side and kind of like trying to look what's, what's in this light. They don't dare to go in. However, if you do, um, you have to stand in front of the picture frame and then something magic happens because you're casting a shadow on it. In the middle of it, like in the shadow, you will be able to read a text that is projected from the back of the picture frame. So it's light. And you obviously can only read it when you cast a shadow in it. The moment you step to the side, the much brighter light from the front will just, you know, erase it. And that moment is absolutely breathtaking. And it says something in German, you come to uh, the center of Germany because Kassel is very central in the country, to read the word art under your own shadow. Well, that's what this artist chose to do, but the spatial experience of this room with the light, with the shadow, with the people, with the text, it was absolutely fascinating. And what I did out of curiosity, I just sat in one corner of the room. I felt like for half a day, maybe it was an hour and a half. I uh, had to get out. My back was hurting at some point. Um, but what I investigated over that period of time of people coming in, looking, looking again, going in, being able to read, getting super excited, you know, showing it to other people, like this whole process of emotional journey. 
was so unbelievably interesting to observe. So I had my own journey, but then to see others and many others and see, you know, the different types of personalities and, and ways of how it went, whether they're alone or in groups, it really told me a lot. And ever since, whether it's my own work or other people's work, I try to find time to observe how people react to things, to learn about these mechanisms. If you don't understand that, how do you want to design something that works? If you have no clue how people tick, how do you want to come up with something that attracts them or that makes any emotional you know, suggestion? So I find it extremely important to investigate emotions. Now, um, if you're interested in all the different things I did, you can just check my website. I'll only quote a few selected projects out of that. And for those of you who will be part of the afternoon session, um, if you have a specific question to a specific project that I did or like how or when or why, uh, you can take a look there. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, however, um, I'm now going to show, I think, four different projects in detail and talk a bit about the design process and the reasoning behind it. Um, so this is a watch. It's the picture also I gave Valentina for showing it for this talk. Um, it's a gold watch. It's relatively expensive, unfortunately, at least in gold, uh, but that's more to do with the movement and the material. Um, so I've been doing a lot of different watches and this one uh, in particular was an interesting, it's always an interesting process, but uh, in this case, um, we had to integrate an extremely well and complicated movement in the sense that the movement alone was already very valuable. And just to give you, I mean, there is a, lo a long range of expensive watches. This is not on the top of that. This is, I think, around 18,000 Swiss francs. So you can spend half a million on a watch if you like, but let's keep it in this area. Uh, just to give you an, a perspective on what makes this so expensive is just to produce such movement, the time it takes to, by hand, get all the details in and, for instance, um, this part that holds um, the regulator, uh, this part is usually uh, engraved by hand. It's a tradition in watchmaking. And instead of making a fancy uh, grid, they choose to write by hand, uh, made with love in glass hütte, its where it's originated. So someone sits there with some sharp thing and on this tiny, 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 tiny plate, engraves by hand this sentence. So yeah, that's just uh, to explain you <laughs> this setup. So now I'm asked to make a fantastic watch design around that fantastic movement, which is obviously not the easiest thing to be asked. Um, however, um, since it's not the first watch I did, um, what we did at some point in the process of making watch designs, we analyzed bloody every watch we found that we thought was interesting. So it was really in our core interest to get it, to see what are the archetypes and this kind of serious analyzing of what are the most you know, extreme interesting typologies within the genre that you're working on is something that can be on every start of a larger project. Cause then you really understand your options and your like your different paths. Um, obviously this is the market. So it's all the other competitors around. And you have to also understand the client itself especially if they have a, an identity. So since I've been working for them for many years I was able to um, use existing models that we did and kind of try to rearrange 
uh, certain elements of it in a very uh, future or in a not uh, typical way to say, look, if we have this part that works this way and this part that works that way, can we not you know, combine it that way? And they're like, oh, we never done that before. So it's a typical situation. And I choose this picture here because it could also be part of a building or a detail of a wall or, you know, it's like tiny architecture, if you like. So you have to understand your details and the materials and the kind of, you know, extremes of what's possible to be able to make a good design. And that is no difference whether you're making an expensive watch or a cheap watch or a, a building for that thought. Um, so the story that I was following for this design, and that's something I learned when I was still working for Hannes uh, Wettstein, the main characteristics that you can actually bring into the watch besides the general size, which is most of the time related to the movement inside, is the connecting part between the main body and the band. So this gives, it's almost like our nose in our face. You know, if you change the shape of the nose, the face looks completely different. And that's a bit what this thing does. Um, so getting a story for that and understanding how this shape should run and why, uh, this is very much part of the process. So um, you have to analyze the existing designs that a company already did. So by understanding them, you can then say, should the new watch be part of that family or should it be something else? I did a bit something in between. So I was relating to existing designs like classics that they had in their collection, one called the Tangente, which has a similar but very Bauhaus inspired, like blocky design of that. And my idea was to make the most beautiful variation of that. So I was working on this, I don't know, for weeks, I was just ch changing shapes of that tiny, tiny, tiny part. And that was one of the, of the um, uh, models that they made for us, like a, um, model made out of um, out of metal. Um, but before we get there, we usually make a lot of variations in plastic. And that's something that is very nice in um, watch design is that a rapid prototyping, um, uh, yeah, a prototype, it costs so very little. So you can't make a big detail like that, but in watches, it just costs uh, very little to make that. So the process here really becomes um, more sculptural in a way. But then in the end, and that's maybe something also to learn from, um, you have to fight for your details. So in the process, they wanted to make um, a rounded glass. And I wanted to have a so-called box glass, which is a glass that has two different um, lines. So you can see this is one radius, a big one, and there is a smaller one. So you get a kind of breaking of the light in this area. Hmm. The reason why I wanted this was to have a very profound look that I found in older watches. <coughs> and they didn't really follow this idea because it's more expensive to make this glass. It's more, it takes more time. It's not a standard pro polishing process. You need extra tools. However, I convinced them eventually to go this way. Um, and what we could achieve with this, and it seems ridiculous, but in the end, it turned out to become extremely vital because we have this glass that goes like a long stretch here, and then it goes down instead of what you see before, which is one radius. Um, you have a limitation of the distance between the dial and the glass. So you can't get closer than that. Otherwise, your dial will scratch from the inner side of the glass. Um, now, 
because of this radius, we had a limitation where we could end. And because we made the, the box glass, we could kind of uh, change that in a minimal way, but uh, it changed uh, the look of the design. And another part was that we got a kind of tangency over that uh, instead of this reaching here and then changing the direction into that. So there is a few small details there. And yeah, if you look at the final result, you get this super smooth um, surface from the glass to the, to the gold. And you get this kind of secondary ring of a light reflection into the glass. And that I think really gives a certain quality and refinement of the look into the in the into the frontal view and yeah just working on the crown it seems so trivial but the shape of each of the toes and the dimension of it we took a long time to narrate that to the end so this is what i say about making variations 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 <coughs> sorry uh, this is another watch um, this one is for Braun, a bit of complicated setup of why I ended up designing a watch for Braun. However, um, the opportunity was amazing and um, learning about the history of the Braun watches was extremely, um, yeah, was extremely identity giving for me. So the company stands for like German form follows function, history of design in many ways. Uh, the watch is not so necessarily, it's like a side product they do. However, because it's brawn, still they matter. And Dieter Rams together with another designer, uh, Dietrich Lups, at the time when they did the first watches, they decided on an archetype um, that then was continued throughout all the different generations. And understanding that archetype was an important factor for designing something new. And the idea was that they, well, they never wrote that down. It's just obvious when you look at all the watches. So they had this one cylinder and then the band would just kind of run directly into it like chuck. Okay, so you see this was the first one. <coughs> the second one, they had, they had to add like a soft band instead of the first one, which was from metal. So they chose for this kind of attachment part, again, running directly into the cylinder. Next generation, many years later by another designer, Peter Hart Hartwein, um, again, decided on a similar um, solution because it was, 2000 and they made it a bit more soft and rounded and yeah but the main idea was still the same uh, and this was the last one that was made in that uh, succession um, and they kind of still use this element they made it a bit more like rounded from my point of view it kind of got less strong less strong less strong and what i wanted to do is to give it the original intention back this idea of you have a central part and bam, you stick in the band. However, today's watches are much bigger than the old ones. So the obstacle we had is if we use a huge watch dimension that we have today, especially for male arms, you end up so far out with this design that it becomes ridiculous. You know, it, it sticks out too far. So the idea was to use the same typology, but instead of running sideways into the cylinder, we would kind of run underneath. So that was the design solution we choose as a strategy. And yeah, we worked hard to get that through. It wasn't so easy. This was one of the earlier uh, prototypes we made with rapid prototyping. <coughs> and this is the final watch. And the reason why it was complicated is that when you have a small, a smaller back compared to the front, it means that you cannot get the movement in from the back. Uh, so somehow the movement has to come into the watch. And in order to do that, usually you open the back. Most of the watches you have probably 
have screws on the back or one big thing to open like a like a, a, a large disc. Um, in this case, we had to bring in the movement from the front. And in order to maintain this design that everyone loved, uh, but no one knew how to make it, it was necessary to find a production process. It was not an invention. They used an old idea, but they redefined it. Uh, and it means that this piece is screwed in from the side and the movement comes in from the front. And in order to get it back out for service, um, you then have to open the case by getting out this dial and you blow in pressure air from the back and that kind of pops out the glass to the front so you can get out the dial and the movement. So it was a tricky thing to establish for a relatively simple watch when you look at it. Um, furniture. Um, I've been fortunate to be working for some furniture companies in the past, one of them, uh, Horgen Glavos, and yeah, we were able to design several objects for and with them. Super nice company here in Switzerland, extremely well-made uh, wooden products. Um, and one of the design processes, uh, I'll show a bit the uh, step-by-step thing. Um, it was a contact already established by Hannes Wettstein. So when he passed away, we were able to continue the collaboration with the company. Um, and this is one of the chairs that we designed. And uh, this one, the idea that the client came to us with, or it was kind of grown into a conversation with them um, to use the biggest piece of wood that they could bend. So Hagen Glavos is famous for being able to bend um, wood themselves. So if you look at this uh, leg, it's not taken from a straight piece and just cut into shape. It's a bent element that then precisely gets refined. The reason for that is that bent wood turns to be stronger than non-bent wood. Uh, the other thing, if you don't have it super black, you can also see super nice how the, the fine line of the wood kind of turns into the new direction that it is given by the bending. So this was the, the biggest piece of wood that they could actually get through their machine. And we said, um, if we were able to use that and make one monolithic object that would use that chunk in an ergonomic way, it would really show this very, very unique uh, capabilities of the company. <coughs> so this is when it's still straight um, before it's bent. And this is the design process. So obviously we used existing designs, the icon chair that we also had designed uh, a few years before that, uh, and kind of brought in a lot of details from the current uh, designs. Um, what we developed, it was an idea I saw when I worked as an intern for a company that did designs for trains. Um, they used a mirror to only make half of the train and then hold it to the mirror and then you would see the full train because it's symmetric. Now in a chair, in the design process of a chair, you can do exactly the same. So you can see the mirror here it's a special mirror that is super thin. It's aluminum uh, anodized surface. Now, if you glue this half part to the mirror and then have everything only one time, it will be um, doubled by the mirror. Now, the super cool part of that, there is a few benefits. First, you only have to make half of it. So it's twice as fast. Secondly, and that is much more difficult than you think. It's always symmetric. There's nothing worse than a chair prototype that's not symmetric. It looks horrible. And the crazy part of that is your eyes are so trained with chairs that you will be able to see a difference of, let's say, five millimeters. So if this leg is five millimeters further to the, to the side than this one, you will easily be able to see there's something wrong. Um, so with the mirror, obviously that's impossible. Um, and the last part that turned out to be extremely helpful when making 
at least soft prototypes, meaning you make them out of foam. You can see the material here, you know it. It's this like soft foam that you can easily uh, cut with hot wire or a cutter and you can sand it super smooth. Um, if you want to make a chair, it's so fragile that it's extremely hard to fix everything together without it falling down. Now, if you have a mirror, you just basically glue the seat and the backrest with a lot of double-sided tape to the mirror. And then the legs only have very, very little supporting, additional supporting help. And that makes it much easier. Now, what I wanted to say with this is, this kind of unique uh, prototyping idea that we mm, developed and optimized through the years helped us tremendously in being able to um, formulate these ideas in a very efficient way. Yeah, so a few more pictures of the process. And then once you have the final shape you're happy with, you give it to the uh, prototyping uh, staff of the company and they take uh, their their measurements from your design and they transfer it into a real size prototype. Um, this is how they bent the wood. I just thought I'd show you because it's so unbelievably crazy. So this stuff comes out of an oven. It's steamed under pressure for many hours inside a super hot steamy pressure chamber and then it gets soft at least soft enough so you can squeeze it into place and now you hope that this just works <laughs> so they put it into this shape and then uh, you can see the force of you know the wood being very unhappy about this However, after uh, you put it in a drying chamber, I think for two days or something, it's dried out in a very steamy, uh, in a very hot, dry room. Um, the wood remains in that position. So you can take off the clamps and it will just remain in that position for the rest of its being. Even you make it wet again, it just remains there. It's an unbelievable physical trick in the wooden structure. However, in terms of the design process, um, once you have the first prototype, it's an extremely sometimes painful process of analyzing and optimizing and showing the client what you want to adapt and change and trying to formulate your changes in a way that they get it. It's not easy sometimes to say here a few millimeters this way, here, there. So to learn to do these kind of changes that it's very similar to interior architecture, obviously, where you say, ah, move this wall a bit, change this detail. But in a 3D object of that complexity where few millimeters matter so much, um, yeah, it's important to find a process that works for yourself, that communicates what you want to change, how you want to change it, what they have to do. Um, in this case, and I'll just quickly click through that, because we made the chair and we also do scenography, we wanted to make an installation for them for the Designer Saturday in Langenthal. So first we thought we'd do something with music. So you can see a string here that would actually make some noise. I made this whole here like a guitar. Didn't sound so good. So we went for a different uh, strategy and we made animals like looking objects out of those huge bent objects. And the frontal part was the backrest. And out of that idea, we made a little herd of these bigger and smaller animals. And by hanging a weight to the back, they would really kind of move their heads in a very funny way. So that became an installation where people would just walk through, they would touch the wood, they would find it funny how they behave. And this was the scenography of the final exhibition in Langenthal 2004, 12, I think, 12. Um, another project we did for Theo Jakob 
actually ended up not being a design, at least almost none. I mean, yes, we designed these objects and we made a wall here, but it turned out that designing for Theo Jakob was less necessary for this exhibition than giving them a platform for people to meet and to watch and to talk. So we made a bar at the entrance. We made this welcoming uh, Theo Jakob thing because it was the 60th birthday of the company. And behind that, we had a concert. And this concert um, was three extremely talented musicians making music with furniture, with furniture that you can buy in the Theo Jakob shop. So this concept we developed over uh, a few weeks um, to say, let's not make objects. You already have the nicest looking objects one can think of. Let's use them and show them in a completely different way. So what they did, they used pickup microphones and, and directed microphones to pick up the sound of those objects um, and then um, create a song out of samples that this guy was putting into the computer and with a special software, I think Logic or something like that, or Live, Ableton Live, he was just looping the different um, samples into a song. Um, and I'll show a little video of that. Ah, this is the top view of the exhibition. So basically we had this a bit strange angled room. So we made this wall with the logo to the front. This is where most people were hanging out, get a catalog. And then we had this huge red carpet and the stage with the object. And obviously all the objects, it looks a bit like a COVID a uh, distancing thing, no? That was not the case at the time. Um, so people were sitting on uh, Theo Jakob furniture that we also put uh, into the audience from the showrooms uh, that we had access to. And then, yeah, you had the stage. So this is the testing. Like we went to Theo Jakob and we just tried the different furniture, how it sounds. So we knew which one to ask them to borrow for that. So for like two hours, we just walked through the archives and, and just, you know, try everything of how it sounds. And then, yeah, this is the final installation. It's already the music, no? That came out of it. So maybe what to take back from this, the best idea sometimes doesn't require for you to design something new. It's more an idea that kind of transfers the existing. Uh, the last project I'm showing quickly um, is an installation I did for um, Dornbracht and Alape. It's two companies of the same group. One is doing uh, the, the water taps and the other one is doing the faucets. So the installation, I think I showed that to you before, it was made with these funny little um, pieces of foam that were uh, made with helium. So they would fly through the air and it was a really dark and large room um, where people would just walk through and find their way to the, to the uh, second part of the exhibition. And in the second part of the exhibition, uh, we showed the products. So this uh, is an important part of putting into scene the things that are most precious to the company in order for the audience to being able to have this like, oh, moment, not just with your installation and your work, but also with the products. 
So it's not enough to say, look, cool brand, da 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 da, we make a fantastic uh, scenography. Um, and the, the products you put a bit in the back, um, you also have to make sure that they're presented with the highest value to the product. So what we did is we collected moss and we arranged this table. So it's living moss, it's smelled really nice. And yeah, we placed the object in that. And with this strong, like black and white contrast to the green, it, yeah, it had a really, really nice atmosphere. Um, so the trickiest part of all of this was basically to convince all the different parties of the client that this was the way to go, that a natural product, it seems obvious, you know, it's water, it's cleaning, it's nature, let's put moss on the table. They're not so convinced at the beginning. So it's a long convincing process, testing, showing them great pictures to get them accept. And it worked, it was pretty nice. Um, so again, besides scenography and making the tunnel and building all of that, having a big budget to take care of and the helium, which took us quite some headaches to get that right, uh, to get the foam. It was basically to understand what the client wanted for the brands. It's a bit of a complicated case that I'm showing because it's two different brands with the same company. So the first part for me to figure out is what do they want? Do they want an exhibition where it says and you go inside? Do they want an exhibition where it says side by side? Oh, here's Donbach. Oh, here's Alape. Um, and you kind of go in between, back and forth. Or they want something where you say, first is Dornbach, then is Alape. And then you say, look, we are a group and we're a family. Um, basically, we didn't do any of those examples. We made something where we had uh, a start that was neutral, um, which was the installation itself. <coughs> and then we ended with one moment and I show that in a minute where both brands were together in a very, very obvious way. Um, in addition to the question of the branding, we also had to understand how Langenthal Designer Saturday works, meaning how the people walk through the exhibition. So if you have an exit, an entrance and an exit like this, which we had, basically what people do is just run through, Jack. Um, so what you have to change is to give them a longer running zone. So you make a narrative of things to happen. And that is also what we did to kind of have to walk through the back and they come back from the front. And this is the moment I, I talked about before. It was after the installation, the moment where you enter the second part and we showed the Dornpracht archetype and the uh, Alapet archetype of the past together. And that looked really inviting and was like the first moment you understand who is addressing you in this installation. Now I'm coming to the end. Um, and this is a second list of incomplete findings for you to maybe uh, keep for, for uh, the future of your undertaking. Um, Great quote by James Terrell, art is a completed pass. It's not enough to have a great idea that looks fantastic as long as it doesn't work. That's kind of how I would say it. It's not enough to throw it out, someone has to catch it. So it has to be compatible with someone being able to catch what you did. And whether that is art or design or branding or whatever you do, it doesn't matter. It has to be compatible for people to get it. So that's kind of, it seems so, you know, easy, but at the same time, you see projects where you can guess that no one really catches this one. It looks maybe interesting, but it's not working. Second, understand branding. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have a friend who works in advertisement, ask them as many questions as you can. Look at some blogs, watch some YouTube videos, 
this topic is more relevant for you, especially if you want to work in uh, luxury or like bespoke um, uh, factory areas yourself, you have to get how they work, like when they make decisions, how and what for the brand. The whole corporate universe is extremely important to understand. It's super interesting anyway, especially uh, working on your own. Next point, the quality of your project is not good because you are super happy for the client. You have the best, you can work for the best Nikes and whatever in the world. You will not make a good product just because you're so happy about that and because you love them so much. The only thing that really drives you is your own dissatisfaction. Meaning if you're happy too early, it will never be as good than if you always think you can make it better. So it's your own drive that really pushes the project. That you should understand and ask yourself, where should I work? So I'm super motivated, so I can push the project. If you're in a miserable situation, yes, you have the greatest clients, but the people are assholes. You will not be super motivated to make the best for them because, you know, there is no reason to. So put yourself in an environment that you're most effective. This is an interesting a uh, friend of mine who was working for BMW in a strategic uh, in a strategic position, he told me once that if they analyze a new product, uh, a new client, so they do also uh, clients for like super big brands. Um, if they analyze the client they're working for, they are analyzing who's the person in charge. Who is the person making the main decision, making like in the end, giving us the money? Who's that person? And then they analyze what that person needs. Why would, what, what would be the result that we can create with our project to make this person happy or to make this person progress or to make this person shine? What does this person want? And then they tailor make the design based on that, which sounds ridiculous, because one would think that the best result is the best result for the company or for the brand. But in this case, because you're just a small project in a huge undertaking, if you just think, we know it best, what this company needs is this, -da! and then the person that actually hired you to do your project has something in return for hiring you, that doesn't help them. It makes them even weaker within the company because you're proposing not to do what they ask you, but to do something else. They will be very unhappy, <laughs> obviously. So this is an interesting thing. Understand who is your direct receiver of what you're doing and make sure that they're happy. Otherwise, this might be the last project you did for them and so on. Age matters. It's a bit silly to say in this day of age, but I just realized over the time that the older I get, the closer I get to the age of many decision makers, which makes it obviously much easier to talk to them off the record. And that is something obviously very interesting that if you can talk about your holidays with the kids and you know all kinds of private stuff on the side, you will build up a different relationship than just talking about the project. And that turned out to be easier than if you find someone like-minded in a similar age. It just means that for you, the longer you're doing the things, probably the easier things might get for the matter of age. It's just a topic that I thought to name. There is another Maya, it's not with an I, but with a Y. And you can Google this, you will find many uh, descriptions of that. I think it's an interesting way of looking at your project. What is the aim of your result, the result of your project? Should it be super advanced, still acceptable? So it shouldn't be too advanced so no one accepts it. Or should it be just acceptable, 
Um, no, most acceptable, but within that, as advanced as possible. So obviously, this is the innovators, the innovative companies. And if they make it acceptable, they are also able to make some money. Uh, if they don't, they will have an innovation, but no one's going to accept it, so they will get back bankrupt. This here is the ones that make the most money because they make something everyone will accept. And within that, they pretend that it's for, it's, it's for real the most advanced. So understand this for the question of where do you see the client? Where does this client see themselves? And how does that relate to your decisions of the design proposals you make? This is an easy one of hopefully everyone already knows it. If not, I'll quickly show it. You can only have two of the three. So if someone has to be super fast, either the quality will be bad or the cost gets really high. If you want the best quality, it will be extremely expensive or take forever. If you want a very cheap project, either it will take a long time or the, the quality will be shit. So you can, yeah, this can go in all kinds of ways. But to understand this triangle is magic in many, many moments in your career. So keep it in mind. Uh, break the rules. Uh, it's an obvious for me. I've done it many times. Uh, however, you should understand why you're breaking the rules. Just to do it doesn't make sense. But you might have a brief and they ask you to do very specific things. And you realize that the best solution for them would probably be something else. Do it like follow your heart and your guts and present what you think is the most strong. You might be wrong, but if you are right, that's what they're gonna do. And we're coming back to the idea of emotions. People will forget what you said. They will never forget how you made them feel. Uh, this is an important um, situation, especially when you run your own presentations to clients, when they come to your place make sure they take something positive from how you approach them, where they were sitting, put them in the nicest spot of the meeting table and so on. Just make sure they're comfortable, serve them something special to drink. This all can help to make a very, very profound experience of them visiting you, working with you. And this memory, as you know, sticks much longer than blah, blah, blah. So this emotional memory we have is much more sustainable. Reach for the stars. And now I'm kind of making the big bow to the beginning of my talk saying, in order to work best, you have to understand who you are. And in order to answer what are the stars for you that you want to reach, you'd better you know, have an answer to that. And I have a serious moment in my own uh, career where I was in between jobs and someone that I was able to consult, a very smart uh, consultant person um, I spoke to. Um, I explained to her what I'm doing, what I want to do and yeah, what I'm thinking of. And she asked me that, what is reaching for the stars for you? What does it mean? And I had no answer to that. I never thought about it. I never really thought, okay, if I had any opportunity to pick from, what do I want? I don't want to win in the lottery. I don't play the lottery. I want to, what do I want? And that struck me. And what I'm trying to help you with is to get an answer to that. It's a simple, such a simple sentence, but it can be so powerful when you know an answer to that. So this is the last uh, part of my presentation. A few more minutes, so bear with me. Um, knowing what you want should be in the center of your strategy, meaning you have to understand yourself well enough to give an answer to what it is re reaching for the stars, who are like where you want to get. The closer you get to that, the better. Now. Once you know that, or you have an idea, or it's an area of where you think it's going, any decision you take should relate to that. Don't waste your time 
with projects that don't fit into where you want to go. It's a waste of time completely. Um, and in the end, only if you have consistent messages about where you want to go, you can get a reaction to that. I make an example for you. Let's say your master project, dot, like you're doing a project that sounds absolutely amazing and it's kind of okay, yeah, you like it, it's cool. But if I ask you reaching for the stars, you will tell me, actually, I wanna work for this and this great architectural firm. Now you're doing a project that has nothing to do with getting there. Like they will not look at your project, even if it's superb, because they're looking for people that have this and this skills, do that and that. Now, by doing a fantastic project that doesn't attract the people you want to be hired by is a waste of time because you are wasting six months of your super strong, intensive master project. And the result you're gaining there is a parallel string to your main focus. And that for me doesn't make sense. So once you know where you wanna get and why, focus all your energy and attention to create everything on the steps to getting there in a way that it makes sense along the line. Now, this is a fancy uh, chart I'm gonna show. It starts with defining your self image. So you look at yourself and you say, this is what I want. It's your wish. Sorry, why is this so weird starting? Wish. Next step is making a decision. What is the action you want to take? Um, so for instance, you decide on making a certain project or taking a video of it or making a, a certain campaign or making a website towards it. So anything that you defined in the beginning, secondly, you say, what do I need to get there? And you make a decision for an action. Sorry about the weird way this is building up. This is the third part I wanna show. Now what happens after you did is your action goes into a so-called black box. Now you did your website, you did your project, you're sending your portfolio, whatever you do, you made the decision, it's out. Now something happens in the market, in the media, on Instagram, in whatever you put your stuff on. And that reaction then, duck, duck, this is the last one, that reaction is the resulting image. So every time you do this, you should be aware of making a decision based on what you want in order to enable the black box to do the magic to push out of the hopeful, hopefully right reaction to what you wanted. So this will be over and over and over again. This is from my point of view, extremely helpful to understand this. This is what I want. This is what I'm deciding to do. Da -da 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 -da, black box. And then something happens that you can't control, but the better you know your actions, the better you make your decisions, the result will relate to what you wanted. Now, one thing I forgot to finish, and that comes back to storytelling, the sword. Now, 5,000 years later, um, and I told you I was quite fascinated by the design. What struck me with that is that with like symmetry, this like not straight lines that the sword has super nicely arranged to, to each other, the very comfortable radiuses, like all this together created an item that from my point of view, even today looks absolutely beautiful. So what I wanted to say with this is to make something strong and beautiful, it doesn't mean you have to re like reinvent the world. It's enough to understand as much as you can and to get your own personal position on who you wanna be and where you want to put your things and then bringing that together into your designs. And that's maybe what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Simon.
that was really interesting because you really took apart so many things that we've been alluding to in the last weeks, but perhaps in the most complete way so far. So thank you so much for that. Happy to hear. I will, um, I will maybe invite us to proceed at 2.30 with the Maya for students, just because we have now only a few minutes until that session is about to start. Um, but before we break, maybe if there's anybody not from Maya 4 that wants to ask one question to Simon, I just invite you. See, there is maybe Tina or Emma or, yeah, I give you a few moments to ask a question to Simon if you want to. And if, and if not, and everybody needs to digest this information <laughs> in their head, um, we will see us, um, we'll see each other in about 20 minutes with the Maya for, for our closed session. Thank you very much, Simon, for this very nuts and bolts process insight. Right, it was really fascinating. And right. uh, see you in a few minutes for our next session. See you later. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.